Welcome to the God is not an asshole podcast. If you are one of the many people done with religious dogmatism, hang on. You might sense transcendence, but your church or other faith community never seem to get off the ground. You realize that honoring your conscience means more than fitting in and keeping hard to explain rules? Hang on. You could probably think of the goodness in your tradition, and you tried your best to save that baby, but there's so much bathwater. Join your host, David Norman Moore Jr. in California and Carrie Connolly in New Jersey, who are collaborating to bring on guests who have found life on the other side of fundamentalism. Guests with stories of how they have liberated themselves from beliefs that divide us from each other. None of our guests' narratives are identical, but we hope you'll find something in common with each of them. We invite you to experience our common bond as we all inspire even more of us to embrace the true self. Hey, everybody. Today, Carrie and I are excited to share with you the voice and the heart of a a longtime friend of mine, Peter Fitch. And I'm going to jump right in so that Peter, you people will know why you are on. Well, let me first say, you, you know, you've been a really precious friend. You know, I was 50 when I met you and what a place to start a friendship, but it's been amazing, you know? And so anyway, but I, I want to start with a headline from, um, from four years ago, CTV, that's Canadian TV. And the headline on their website was, New Brunswick Church Disowned by National Group for View on Same-Sex Marriage. And I'll read a bit of it. It says, a New Brunswick church says it is being disowned by its Canadian denomination because it refuses to stop performing same-sex marriages. Peter Fitch, pastor of St. Croix Vineyard, he's now retired, but pastor of St. Croix Vineyard and St. Stephen, says Vineyard Canada has asked his congregation to leave the group, which has 45 churches across the country, and stop using the vineyard name. All right, so that will intrigue and appeal to to our audience. Peter, can you just go ahead and tell us your story? (laughs) It just, that's a big story. We had a long, you know, lead up to that. And, uh, and I wrote a couple of books and, uh, and I, I wrote books about how I believed that conservative Christians were making a terrible mistake by excluding the full giftedness of LGBTQ two plus people and two uh, S plus people. And I, I just, I just, let me just would... say two S is, is a, is a designation used more in Canada than in the U S tell us what that is Two spirit. It's yeah. an indigenous characteristic. Yeah or grouping. And I, I just, um, I just felt it was a terrible mistake. And, and I, I had pretty conservative, uh, background myself in, in Christianity. And I just assumed that the sort of the party line was right for a very long time. But I, I, I realized that in my heart, I, I always felt troubled when I was talking to friends that were gay or my, my brother's gay. And I, I always thought there's something, there's something that just doesn't connect. And, and so, um, I began to really think about it. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought there just isn't anything in the Bible against uh, loving, committed relationships. There's, there's a lot about oppression, oppressing other people through sexuality. There's a lot about domination. And, uh, and, and I started thinking, I think we've, we're completely off track here. We've bad, bad interpretations and bad treatment of people. And it's not, it's not in line with the character of Jesus and the whole message, which is supposed to teach us to love people. So I, I, I got off the boat. Okay, so there's uh, this other article from CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Company, it says, St. Stephen Church rebels against order to stop performing same-sex marriages. Fitch says, although they were heartbroken by Vineyard's final decree, they, there aren't any hard feelings between the two groups. Quote, we think that church history is littered with ugly separations, and we just didn't want to do that. David Reith, na- National Director of Vineyard Canada, said he was that he understands Fitch's decision, and the St. Croix Vineyard has his blessing to leave the denomination. Quote, it's not about fighting or right or wrong or anything. They just need to flourish, he said. Okay, so, boy, that could be unpacked. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, but what I wanted to get to, and, and you you have the freedom to do that, but what I wanted to get to is one of the comments uh, in the comment section, uh, someone said something, and I think I think it's worthy of 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 a look. You know, it's not flattering. Someone wrote, and, and I know that you read this, even though it was years ago, you probably recall. Says, I don't think I wrote, I don't think I read the comments. Oh, well, I don't blame you. But anyway, it says here, so these same leaders who teach at SSU forced a colleague from the LGBTQ community out of the school 10 years ago. I'm happy that they are now so accepting, unless, of course, you don't agree with their stance now. Personally, given the people who were broken there, I think one might be wary of the high horse lest they get trod upon. <sighs> I'm not sure exactly what that's talking about. Is it, it could be a reference to one professor who came out and left. Uh, oh, and yeah, I remember that story, yeah. Yeah, so what, I just don't, I don't know. I think I, overall, I, th I think this, this person in the comment section, you know, I mean, it could, it's easy to see them as possibly disgruntled or something, but I'm just wondering if there's a skepticism that it's that is genuine that you know in that moment they became aware that you were not what maybe you had been uh in the, the more remote past yeah for sure so i i think it's a paraphrase but maya angelou said you know i did what i knew when i knew yeah. better i did better yeah I think that's, that's a very just what human I was, thing. <laughs> yeah, that's just what I was about to say is that there's there seems to be in the especially in this world of social media sound bites and tweets or whatever tweets are called these days that there's very little room for our own, our becoming, right? And that's one of the things that as I have grown up a little bit, I reserve the right to my own becoming. I, I you know, and uh, what I say today I, I recognize and realize that tomorrow I may go, wow, that was really dumb. <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and so I reserve the right to, to, to do that and to own my mistakes and make them right, you know. And for me in my own personal journey, and that, this is what I, I, as a pastor, I think it's really important to, to understand the, the struggle that pastors go through because they're facing a lot of different struggles when they are attempting to deconstruct heteronormativity, right? Mm -hmm. Especially Christian heteronormativity. And so, so for me, I was um, a young mom working on staff at a church and I was writing a column for a local paper at the time. And I wrote something, an article that was said, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian mom and I support gay marriage. And I was called into the pastor's office and told, forbidden to write, essentially, and told that, we don't write about divisive things, but essentially if I had been writing, you know, uh, the opposite, I'm sure I would have been fine. Right. Yeah, um, exactly. and right. And, and, you know, I know that that particular church that I was on staff at, eventually I left because I'm, you know, call me a rebel, but nobody's going to tell me what I can and cannot write. So when I know that that church is very split, I know that there are so many members of the LGBTQ plus community there. And or or family members of of LGBTQ people there, and then there are other people who literally still post to this day, you know, the real meaning of the rainbow. And I know that pastors have a very okay, wait, wait, real... what is the real meaning of the rainbow? Oh, it's you know, it's something about God offering. It's from the scripture, God offering, saying he'll never he quote, and I'm using that he very specifically in this particular context that he will never um, harm us again, right? But not the LGBTQ folk, you know, yeah, they don't, they, they they don't, get, they're not included in that, whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's, it makes no sense. Um, but I know that pastors have very real concerns that are in the practical world, right? Because very often if they're leading a church similar to the one that I went to, they run the risk of losing half of their congregation if they come out as affirming. For me personally, coming out as affirming was, a, was an issue as a mom, because before I was able to not take a stance and I was able to be, you know, um, pretty lukewarm and neutral. I'm not proud of that, but I was, it, right. even though I, it didn't sit well with me. But once my kids were born, I had to make a decision. If one of my kids or if both of my kids ended up being gay and one of them is gay, if one of them ended up being gay, was I going, was I willing to let the 
the church or this belief come between me and my kids? And my answer was, hell no. There was nothing that was going to separate me from the love and, and loving my kids no matter what. So my point is, or my question is, what kind of fortitude, thought process, uh, deconstruction goes into the process of a pastor making this very real decision that can have a whole lot of fallout within your own congregation that can be financial, it can be relational, it can be lots of rupture, lots of It was things. all those things. It was all those yes. things. And, and when the book came out, I, I, I actually had three jobs at the time. I was teaching at the university. I was a pastor of a church that my wife and I had planted in St. Stephen, New Brunswick. And, and I was teaching in England at a really innovative theological college. And I lost that job because of the book. So uh, it, it, there were all kinds of implications. I, I, I spent a lot of time walking every day. It's my, it's my strategy against aging. And, uh, and, and Mary Ellen and I do it together. My, Mary Ellen, my wife, and I do it together most days we walk. And um, we've been doing that for years and years. It's, it's good for our mental health. It's good for just appreciating beauty. It's good for slowing down in the midst of whatever's going on. It's good for our relationship. So we just, we just love to walk. And, but if I'm walking by myself, it's a very internal, you know, I just get lost in my head. And, and, and I seemed one year, I guess it was about 2012 or 2013, that I'd spent quite a bit of time with gay students at the university. I, 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 and I just had grad, I thought about it so much, and I gradually come to a conviction that, that I believed that, that the conservative church was wrong about this. And, and, uh, and so I was walking, and I would start to think, Am I going to write something about this? Should I say something about this? And I thought, you know, it's going to, I've got friends around the world from our church connections, the university partnerships. And I, I just, it's going to, you know, a lot of people would be upset. And, and I, I said this to Mary Ellen, I said, I really want to write something. I can feel the urge to do it when the school year's over. But I don't think I can write about this because I just think it'll hurt too many of our friends. And she said, oh, those are the people you should be concerned about? not the people that have been rejected and excluded their whole life. You, you've got all your friends are, you know, full of privilege and, and happiness, and, and you, you're worried about offending them. And, and that, that really hit me. <laughs> when, and when, yet pe- those people do tend to be very offended, very pearl clutchy, right? Yeah. Very, th- those people do tend to go yeah. there. But when I you was, mentioned yeah. ob- observing, you know, being with the, the students, it made me think of, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot of the undergrads, they came, not all of them, but a lot of them came from rural places in Canada, from uh, small towns and uh, who tended to be religiously conservative. And many of, I mean, they didn't come out till they came to the university and they found a safe space, you know, and, and I mean, I know some of those folks and I, I remember um, having conversations. The university has a reputation of turning people's kids gay um, <laughs> because, you know, they come from these places and nobody knows and then they come out and then they go home for, you know, for a holiday or whatever and they go home and they find, find out. And so they blamed the university. Yeah, but it's always kind of like that. If it isn't, If it isn't about this issue, it's just about thinking differently than parents. You know, if, if you spend a lot of time thinking differently than your home church, you know, if you spend a lot of time thinking about these things, it's really possible that your views will broaden. And, uh, and, and if your views broaden about anything and you go home, you, you know, then, then the university can be blamed for that. Yeah. yeah. So I had another, that- uh, oh, Carrie, you go. Oh, I was just going to, but I, I, I really want to hear what you were about to say, but I was just going to say that, I think that, you know, things like heteronormativity and patriarchy are so entwined. And that story just reminded me of a story, again, in which some conservative Christian leaders that I was with, I was, they, they had three children and all of them went to college and the girl, the daughter had decided to no longer be a part of the faith. And they said, they rolled their eyes about what a mistake it was to have sent her to college. Right. And yeah. that that kind of anti-intellectualism in in the fundamental 
church. Just it's it's a little terrifying. It's totally fine that the sons are getting their doctorates at Oxford, mm-hmm. but God forbid the daughter be educated and actually learn about her own oppression. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. mm-hmm. you know, can't have that happen. Sorry. So please, Peter, say what you were going to say. Well, I was going to say there was another thing that was happening on those walks, and one thing, it, especially the walks by myself that year, I, I had this strange, strange feeling internal. It, it's just, it's so hard to put into words, but I had this strange intuition that I, that I ought to be writing something that would connect not only with Christianity, but with Islam. And uh, I thought this was insane because although I, I studied Islam at a seminary in Africa, like 50 years ago, and, you know, and I tried to read the Quran at the time, but I, I just felt like I knew nothing that, that would, you know, qualify me to, to write in a way that, but I, but I imagined that most religions had similar dynamics. And besides, it was just this internal impulse, I have to write something that's going to connect with Islam. So I, um, anyway, I didn't know what to do with that. I finally admitted it to Mary Ellen, which she was the only person I said it out loud to. And uh, I just, unless I said it to, to you, David, I don't, I, I can't remember, but, but it, I just, I just thought it was nuts, but I, I had this feeling. And so what happened was that um, the term got over, I finished the marking and I had a day of listlessness. I just, you know, sometimes when you work too hard, you just don't know what to do with yourself. And you have, in my case, somebody has to direct me to the television and point my head at the screen, you know, cause I, <laughs> I just, I just don't know how to operate when I don't have a whole bunch of tasks, but I didn't like that feeling. So the next day I, I sat down in front of my computer and I thought, well, I wonder if I will write something. And then I just exploded with words for the next six weeks. And, and the book called uh, Learning to Interpret Toward Love, Actually Embracing People of Different Sexualities uh, came leaping. And, oh, and there was a parenthesis in the kind of churches that haven't. <laughs> and uh, oh, s- speaking of the kind of churches that have it that let me just ask because there's a um there's a very strong likelihood that uh, someone uh watching this or listening to this is a pastor who is on the precipice of deciding what you decided years ago okay what i decided years ago as well yeah. um and, you know to to be fully affirming and to come out if you will can yeah. you can you just outline some of the uh, the benefits and the hazards of doing something like that per your experience? I can, but let me finish the story about Islam. Oh, I thought, okay. All right. <laughs> Don't forget. All right. Well, you remind me. But, mm-hmm. So, so I, I, uh, I wrote the book, Learning to Interpret Toward Love. And, uh, and, and I, it just came splitting out. It was just like, you know, I... Non- every day I woke up and I knew what I wanted to write next. I never planned any part of the book. It just came gushing out for six, six or eight weeks or something like that. And, um, and I knew that, that it might be an embarrassment to the college in England. I really loved the college I was teaching at in England, but it was, um, it was a mostly video conferencing. So I'd go there for a week every term or two weeks, and then the rest of it would be by video, video lectures and connecting live with people uh, through video. So, so I was able to do, you know, teach in New Brunswick full time, but also be teaching at this school in England. And uh, anyway, at, at our uh, residency in September, Mary Ellen came with me and she kept saying, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong. And, and I wasn't paying any attention. I was just absorbed in my classes and uh, we're on a university campus in England. And, and, uh, and, and then the dean said to me that she had read the book and she was very concerned. And I said, okay, let's talk about it on the weekend because we're supposed to have a faculty retreat. And when we got to, um, to the weekend, she gathered some people and Mary Ellen and I came and she said, do you have anything to say for yourself? And I went, oh, <laughs> I hadn't thought it would be this serious. But I said, oh, well, I told you when I wrote this book and I sent you a manuscript, I said, if it's an embarrassment that I'll withdraw from the faculty. And she said, Thank you. And I said, ah, okay. And so I got up to leave with Mary Ellen. I said, okay, I'm sure we can figure out the details later. You know, we're in the midst of a term. I'll I'll try to finish my courses. And they said, no, no, please sit down. We want to tell you why we want to accept your resignation. And so one person after another 
went around the room and they all tried to be kind, but they, you know, they prefaced their words with kindness, but then people said some pretty unkind things. And I thought, why would you want to make me mad at you? You know, like I'm a really popular teacher in this program. And I, you know, I, I with, I'm agreeing to withdraw, you know, you, she should just accept that. Anyway, as, as time went on, I got a little angry, got a little upset, brokenhearted. And then out of the blue, I got a letter and the letter was from my brother, who is very close to my cousin, who was a major general in Canada, in Canada's army, who took a real interest in chaplaincy. And a Muslim chaplain had come to him and said, I'm very afraid that our gay brothers and sisters are not getting enough chances to worship. And my cousin, I hadn't seen him in a long time, but he knew about the book. He said, my, my cousin in Atlantic Canada wrote a book about this. And he gave him the book. So I got a letter just at the same time as I'm being dismissed from this college, which was you know, a good portion of our income for the year. And the, uh, the letter that I got was from the imam's wife because he didn't write online. And uh, she said, my husband thinks that he, he must come and stay with you. And he come and live with you for four days. And this man, this elderly imam, we came to believe he was a saint. He came and lived in our home. And uh, we just had great adventures with him for four days. And, and uh, he's on my mind really all the time right now because he's dying during this, this period of time. And, you made me think too of, uh, oh, wait a minute. I already asked you a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't have too many questions of mine. <laughs> But I, I, that was just the most amazing connection to me because it wasn't, you know, a serious, I, I wasn't influencing Islam or anything like that. And yet yeah. it was, it was this wonderful connection. And together during those four days, we created a, a strategy and a plan for multi-faith uh, gay worship once a month services in his city. So this is a, it was just pretty neat. And then later we were able to visit and have Ramadan feasts with, with this family. And it's so, that's yeah, so I keep amazing. jumping in in the middle of your uh, sentences. I have uh, more. <laughs> you have more. Okay. But let me just say this, and then you can keep going. All right. uh, you're reminding of me of oh, one time I was there at a city council meeting and they were preparing to receive Syrian refugees. You know, I mean, that's a beautiful thing for the city to actually be doing that. But you made me think of how your church, when you were still holding that position, opened, uh, gave a key to uh, to some Syrians to have uh, Friday prayers. Yeah, I thought that was beautiful. Well, better than that, um, now they use the church for Saturday night feasts for all the Muslim families in our community uh, during Ramadan. So, so, and 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 some of us go too. They've invited all. The, 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 the people that helped the refugees who came to town, we established dear friendships. So, so now um, Mary Ellen and I get invited to, to uh, all of these feasts. And the food is just out of this world. Oh, right? my goodness. Yes. <laughs> that sounds a lot like the beloved community to me. I don't know. We just love Maybe it so me, much. But yeah, There's, that's so beautiful. Yeah. That's so beautiful. So here's just the last thing. This is, and I say something that sort of, before you get back <laughs> to your other story or your other question. So my, the major general, my cousin that gave the book to the Muslim uh, imam, he's a very serious Jewish man. His faith means a great deal to him. And half of my family is Jewish. And, and so this is, this is my background too. But, but he, he, and, uh, he, he has this deep friendship with this same imam. And recently, as the imam began to die, one of the, he's in hospice right now, one of, the, one of the things that he wanted done when he knew that my cousin was going to Jerusalem now to spend time, uh, as he does each, win, each, each year in Jerusalem with his wife, he gave him sadaka, he gave him um, money, a large amount of money, to give to the poor in Jerusalem, because this was what he wanted to express with his heart as he was dying. And he is very, very taken with a vision of the temple in Jerusalem split in two. And what he believes is that the temple is a picture of God's heart for the suffering of the Palestinian people and the suffering of the Jewish people. And he thinks that the temple split in two is a, is, is a demonstration of the pain in God. 
over over the yeah, broken yeah. relationships. And and so he wanted to give money to my Jewish cousin to give to the poor in Jerusalem, Arab or is or Jewish. And my cousin has been writing back, and I've been reading the letters. And he says, when I do this, every time I give the money that you've given, I feel the wind of spirit strength through me. And I believe mm. that it's also with you in your bed in hospice. I have, I've paraphrased the words a little bit, but I'm, and I'm reading the love back and forth between this Muslim family and Jewish family. And, and I'm a Christian watching and I, it just makes me believe that there is the potential for a beloved community someday. That is beautiful. It's, it's stories like that, that, you know, can, can keep us going when we start to feel so Ooh. frustrated and discouraged, right? It yeah. reminds me, um, and I think I've mentioned this before. I'm looking over here because I, it's, I'm trying to find where I wrote it. But there's a, um, there's a TikTok that I saw one time and it was about a, a young, a young guy. And he was at an, I think at an airport and he was watching a young girl and her mom, a young white girl play with her dolls and her, her dolls were all different races. She had a black doll. She had a white doll. She had, you know, another, I don't, I don't know what they were, but he called, he said, I looked at that and all of the dolls were friends. They were all playing together. Everybody was getting along. And he goes, I call that a micro progression. <laughs> and I just love that idea, right? I, I'm so like taken with that idea. And, yeah. um, and I just, I, I think that that is a really great way to look at it. And I think that we need to look for more micro progressions and look for the opportunities to create micro progressions. And I think the stories that you just told are great examples of micro progressions. I, I the too. Uh, I just, yeah. One of the families that we met at a Ramadan feast had just come from Morocco to our area. The uh, the mom was going to teach for, is is teaching French in one of the schools, and the dad was uh, found a job downtown, and and they ended up moving just about two houses away from us, actually in a house that the that our university owns, and they're renting, and so I. Uh, you know, we had them, I guess they had us over for dinner first and uh, we went over and had a wonderful time. And then we had them over for dinner and must have been 20 or 30 years ago, a friend of mine who's an antique dealer had uh, done an estate sale and he come up with this Quran, beautiful script, gilt edges to the pages, box set and in Arabic. And he said, I don't know what to do with this. So I thought maybe I'd give it to you. Maybe you would know. And, uh, and I just had it sit on my shelf for all those years, 20 or 30 years. It's too beautiful to throw away, but it, I don't read Arabic. And then this young family's coming over, the little boys, and, uh, and we started to walk them through the house to show them the house and, and the things we'd done in it. And, uh, and I remembered, and I, I ran and I got it, and I said, any chance you would like this? And the man began to hug me, and the woman, the wife began to weep. And she said, we've been looking everywhere, trying, we've, we've had one sent from Morocco. We tried to get a script that's appropriate for him to read. And it hasn't, we can't find the right thing. And during Ramadan, we have to read a lot. And I, uh, he, was, he always wants to read my, my Quran. <laughs> and we just wanted him to have his. Can you believe that it would happen here in this little rural town? And it was like it was waiting here for him. But the thing that I, the micro progression here is, I look at this and I go, gee, I don't feel that way about any text that's sacred in my tradition, you know? And I'm going, look at the reverence, look at the love. They were just radiant with joy for the rest of the night. And, uh, and you know, we love these guys. And, and uh, this was really special that we got to connect in that moment. And I'm thinking, man, I can learn from you your, your reverence for your sacred text is a, is a beautiful example for me to hold things reverent too. Thank you so much for being here today. We are people who have left behind performance-based religion and the shame that comes with it. Maybe you have a personal liberation story to tell and we want to know about it. Please contact us on Twitter at God is not an asshole or text 805-703-8393. 
because the world needs to know that God is not an asshole. The show's music is composed by Christian Moore, show art created by Evan Kerr, and the episodes are produced by Josh Perez.